Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Diana as patient, and I am pretty ill. I am wrapping up part two of the Driscoll theory, and I can hardly wait to show it to you. But until then, I got a request to hear part one in layman's terms. Actually, the request was from my sister. I asked her if she'd read the theory, and she said she didn't understand it, but to let her know when the layman's version came out. You gotta love our family, they tell it like it is. So I was also asked, wow, Diana, no one else had figured out the link between EDS and hydrocephalus before? Was that really you? How did that happen? Well, my friends, shocking, I know, but yes, that was me, and I'll tell you how that came about too. So here we go. I've divided the theory into three basic pieces, and today we'll talk about external communicating hydrocephalus and ehlers danlos Next time we'll discuss mast cell disorders, and then finally, We'll chat about CCSVI. Sound good? Okay. Hydrocephalus, meaning too much fluid pressure on the brain, right? The way I figured this out and why being a patient and a doctor really helped. First, when I got sick from a virus, I developed autonomic dysfunction. And as you know, basically everything that your body should do without you thinking just goes. You know, your heart rate, digestion, temperature regulation, blood pressure, breathing, etc. I couldn't pinpoint what the heck was going on. So I looked for something measurable, something objective, and figured out that my heart rate went up a lot when I stood up and I felt sick for hours after that. So I googled fast heart rate when standing. Now why my doctors never did that is anybody's guess, but sorry I digress. So Okay, I googled and then up popped POTS and I could see that most of my symptoms were related to the autonomic system. So good. Next, the good part. I wasn't getting anywhere with traditional POTS treatment. You know, Gatorade, water and salt tablets, beta blockers, mitodrine, mesonon, blah, blah, blah. And I was becoming completely exhausted. I needed to find some other symptom or sign that was as objective as possible. I had developed a horrible headache in the back of my head and it was spread to my neck and the tops of my shoulders. It was, con it was constant and I was miserable. So, okay, it's not completely objective, but it was definitely repeatable. Now, it was around this time that I noticed when I played my flute, my tremor would worsen dramatically. Oh, here's a picture of my hand when I played the flute. I wore ovalates, ring splints, lots of tape, had to rig a ledge up to hold the flute. Such dedication. Yes, participating in choir and orchestra is one of those losses we have to accept, a story in and of itself. Okay, my ADD is showing. Anyway, I knew as a doctor that tremor with Valsalva, blowing or straining, meant high intracranial pressure. That's where being a doctor helped. Now, this was confirmed when my cortisol levels went below normal and I began taking a steroid. I wasn't sure if the low cortisol was due to my adrenals failing or my pituitary or my hypothalamus. I knew if it was my adrenals failing that I would need Floronef, which is a mineralocorticoid and helps with fluid balance and retention. I'm sorry, I'm stepping outside the layman's version again. Okay, Florinef is used for POTS because it increases our fluid intravascularly. So I thought I should try it anyway. It makes sense. So I took Florinef and, ooh, holy smoking cow, my headache and neck ache were a hundred times worse and it felt like head pressure. I knew I had too much intracranial pressure. Now, who here has taken Diamox, acetazolamide, for going snow skiing, say back in good old days? It is used for altitude sickness and it's used for emergency closed angle glaucoma as a treatment to decrease the fluid pressure of the eye. All good eye doctors have an expired bottle of Diamox somewhere because it expires because we see one of these patients maybe every five to seven years or so. So I knew I needed to take the pressure off. So I dug around and pulled out that old expired bottle and took a couple of pills. Now don't try this at home and I am in no way advocating taking expired medications, okay? I was a woman on the edge, and disclaimers, disclaimers all over the place. Well, thank heavens, the next morning though, the pressure was gone. The headache and neck ache were gone and I no longer felt like I needed to be decapitated. I also no longer felt the need for neck fusion or Chiari surgery, amazingly. After a couple of weeks, my periods came back. Sorry guys, bear with me. After many weeks, some of the autonomic symptoms started to improve and I was able to decrease my medications. I lowered my doses of Cymbalta and Xanax and wildly, I no longer felt a need to wear my hard cervical collar even in the car. I could handle the bumps and jostling with few of any issues. Before Diamox, I didn't dare get into a car without my hard cervical collar. 
this is when I realized that Diamox was taking off some of the pressure around the brainstem. It was treating the cause of our symptoms. Now, I had symptoms of pressure on the front and the back of my brainstem. Chiari symptoms are symptoms on the back of the brainstem, basically, but they were actually improving. And next, I considered how most of us have subtle symptoms our entire lives. Most of us have low-level anxiety, OCD tendencies, or we exhibit it as overachievement. Many of us have motion sickness, too, throughout our lives. I was trying to help people whose kids had neurological symptoms early on, but no one paid any, any attention to some of those subtle and some not so subtle symptoms because they couldn't explain them. I heard of everything from fits of uncontrollable crying and irritability to tremors, stuttering, seizures, and even cataplexy, and of course delayed motor development and delayed speech. I wondered what could cause that. It seemed almost like epilepsy in some patients. Then it hit me. I realized we were likely born with too much pressure on our brains, but it wasn't high enough to alarm the doctors. I remember the day I put this all together. I ran upstairs to pull out my kids' baby records. My hands were shaking as I put them in chronological order. And I graphed out their head circumferences, weights, and lengths for the first 15 months. Bam, there it was. My kids' head circumferences went from about the 25th percentile to about the 95th percentile in the first 15 months of life before the sutures of the skull had closed. Then it was a matter of just asking anyone and everyone for their numbers, which isn't easy since doctors haven't always taken those measurements. But every single one showed a rapid increase in head size in the first 15 months, and their weights and lengths didn't show that. So here is a graph of the results from the first dozen or so patients who had reliable numbers. I can't tell you how many people had no numbers but had histories of high pressure in the form of pseudotumor cerebri, or I even had one person say that they, the doctors had cut the top of her head off, <laughs> she was a baby, and she asked if that was for hydrocephalus. Oh, uh, yeah, probably. Right. Hydrocephalus means basically too much fluid pressure on the brain. Now, communicating means there's no physical blockage of flow along the pathway, if you will. External means the ventricles in the center of the brain where the fluid is produced are not enlarged. The increase in pressure is actually around the brain in an area we call the subarachnoid space. It's slightly more complicated than that because in Ehlers-Danlos, the tissues around the brain are made up of collagen. Now, this is the likely reason that the slightly high volume of fluid collects around the brainstem in what's called the cerebromedullary cistern, among other places. Now this fluid puts pressure directly on the brainstem, almost like you're milking a cow, if you can imagine. Now, some of it collects in the ventricles, spaces in and around the brain structures, causing other little weird symptoms that can come and go. This is why our doctors tend to dismiss our symptoms. They don't see on an MRI what they would typically look for. Now, long story short, both of my kids and I are now on Diamox. Their headaches are gone, basically, and patients who have had that occipital headache, the neck ache, pain over the tops of their shoulders, those whose ears ache sometimes or sound squishy, those people who are more symptomatic with Valsalva, or the ones with daily nausea and motion sickness are consistently responding beautifully to Diamox or Neptazane if they're allergic to sulfa drugs. And it's working through their doctors, of course. Trying to explain to their doctors though why we're encouraging use of a drug that is also a mild diuretic when we typically would push fluids is a trick. But because you know right away if it helps, we're working past that fairly well. Now, and most doctors realize when traditional treatment is not effective, we are miserable and they are at a complete loss as I would be if I wasn't one of the people in one of these bendy bodies, you know. Um, but I tell them that we're working on eliminating the cause of the autonomic dysfunction. We are not treating the symptoms. Usually they get that. Anyway, I knew hydrocephalus was a huge piece of the puzzle, but not all of it. We were still sick, better, but sick. Stay tuned for the next section, mast cell disease, how I figured that out and how I was not the only one to figure that out and what that has done for us. Until then, my friends, hang in. I know how difficult this journey is every day. I live with it, and as you do, every single day. We will continue to change our world one brain cell at a time. Till then, next time, channel hugs to you all.